I'm going to be talking about secure storage, uh, which we're going to sort of use for the project and also for anything you ever do in the future that remotely involves passwords ever. Because uh, this is really important. This is the probably the number one thing that companies fuck up and gets in the news uh, all the time. If you use LastPass, it will tell you when some company has fucked up and you need to change your password for them. So you should use LastPass. Uh, and you should run security scans regularly. They will tell you all this stuff. So first of all, though, uh, what does it mean to store something securely? Uh, this is actually a more important question than you might expect because you know the obvious is like, oh, uh, somebody else can't get it. OK, but like, what does that mean, right? So there are three main uh, points. First one is confidentiality. That one's obvious. That's like the secret is confidential, right? OK, we all know what that means. The next is authenticity. This is that anyone you are communicating the secret to in any way is actually the correct person. Because confidentially communicating a secret to an attacker is not particularly helpful. And just like it's great that it's confidential to the attacker, but it's still to an attacker, right? And the last one is integrity. Uh, this is just that uh, the integrity of the secret is kept. So in the case of a password, uh, it doesn't have a whole ton of meaning. But as far as storage goes, it means that if the storage is corrupted or if the access to the storage is somehow intercepted and modified, then you can know that somebody has tampered with your access to the storage. And as far as storing things, that usually comes out in like stuff called message authentication codes and other hashing algorithms that we'll sort of get to. But as far as storing passwords, it doesn't really happen. Like, uh, there's not a whole lot of integrity there except, you know, don't get hacked. Uh, so confidentiality, this basically means encryption, uh, which is the first thing I'm going to talk about because encryption is fun. So there are three types of encryption. The first one is symmetric encryption. This is sort of what we think of as far as what encryption is. This is you know, really where you have a key and you encrypt something with it and then decrypt it with the same key. It's kind of like you know, encrypting a file with a password. That would be symmetric encryption. The next is asymmetric encryption, which is more complicated and way cooler. Uh, and then there are one-way functions, which aren't actually encryption, but they are a way of maintaining confidentiality. Um, so symmetric encryption, it's the pretty conventional type of encryption. It's what you think of. You have the key, you decrypt with the key, and it's fairly computationally cheap. We can encrypt you know, hundreds of megabytes per second or whatever with most symmetric algorithms that we use today. It's great. Uh, most websites you connect to, if you're connecting securely, use some kind of symmetric encryption because it's fast. Christina will talk about that next time. But the big issue with symmetric encryption is what do you do with the key? If your password storage strategy is let's encrypt the keys and encrypt the passwords with uh, some key, you know, if you get hacked and they get all your passwords, why can't they also get your key that you're using to decrypt the passwords? Because you kind of need to decrypt the passwords to use them, right? So it's not a great password storage strategy. Uh, but with some symmetric algorithms, as far as good ones go, 128-bit uh, AES in GCM mode. It's the best one that we have right now. Uh, if you're going to ever encrypt something that you're storing, you should use this encryption scheme. So bad ones include uh, DES or triple DES. Uh, what? Yeah? Uh, just kind of briefly, what does GCM mode specify? Uh, it's just a way. So AES specifically is a pseudo-random function that is part of a block cipher. And what that means, with, and a block cipher is something that takes a block of data and then like changes it and munges it, munges it around, so like encrypts it. And usually that's a fairly small block of data, like a few bytes. And if you want to encrypt more than a few bytes, you need to then encrypt the next block of data and the next, but that doesn't work because if you encrypt two blocks of data the exact same way, it's just like it's a mess. It doesn't work. It's insecure. It can be broken. So there are different modes of using AES. Uh, the most e the easiest to explain is cipher block chaining, which is where you encrypt the first block, 
and then you encrypt the second block like sort of with the first block, right? So you use the key to encrypt the first block, and then you encrypt the second block with the first block's encrypted version, and then you sort of go from there. And that has some problems with it, too. GCM is just one particular mode of running AES that currently doesn't have any problems. It's like the most secure that we know of, yeah. But uh, all the modes of running AES have been built on the previous modes to fix problems, so GCM is pretty good. So bad ones are DES. DES is the data encryption standard. It's old. It uses a very small key. So AES 128-bit uses a 128-bit key. The amount of bits in the key determines the hardness, because that's how many possible keys there are, right? So it's very hard to break a 128-bit key if the algorithm is good, like AES. Uh, but with a 56-bit key in DES, that's way easier to break. Uh, like a gazillion times easier. It's pretty bad. Uh, DES is next to worthless right now. Uh, triple DES is an attempt to fix this. It's literally just you, you have three keys, and you apply DES three times. One forwards, and then one backwards, and then one forward again. <laughs> Which is technically more secure, but not a lot more secure. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, double DES is actually less secure than regular DES because of a cute meet in the middle attack, but it's not important. Okay, the other one that is not that good is RC4. Uh, I should mention DES, triple DES, and RC4 are all in use now by older web browsers and other stuff. But like, if you if you're writing new software, you should not use them. Uh, so RC4 is another older algorithm. Uh, it's fine, it's just not good. Uh, and there are some attacks against it that are bad, uh, but a lot of people are able to mitigate those attacks in smallish ways, but there's just no point in using it. Like, AES is faster, it's more secure, like, why, and just don't. Okay, moving on. Asymmetric, asymmetric encryption is also called public key encryption. So what you do here is you create a private key and this sort of acts like a password. Uh, and then once you have this private key, which is typically very large, uh, you can derive a public key from the private key. And then you have two keys, which is great. The private key you keep private. Shocker. Uh, the public key you're free to give to anyone. And this is how it works. Uh, so when you, when you have those two keys, if you encrypt something with one key, you can decrypt it with the other but you can't encrypt and decrypt with the same key, right? So if you encrypt something with a public key, the only thing they can decrypt it is its corresponding private key and vice versa. So this has a bunch of cool properties, namely that you can prove who you are. Uh, go back one. Because if somebody has your public key and they, and they encrypt some data, like say they encrypt, you know, I like pancakes, and then they encrypt it, and then ask you, what did I just encrypt? And you can decrypt it with your private key, which you're supposed to be keeping secret. That proves that you have the private key, and that proves who you are. So it's a really cool system. Uh, but it's super, super computationally expensive. Like I said before, that symmetric ciphers, you can encrypt stuff at hundreds of megabytes per second. With asymmetric encryption, you're looking at a few kilobytes a second. It's just not good. It involves a lot of like prime exponentiation of like a very small amount of data at a time, it's bad. So uh, it's typically used with symmetric encryption in order to make the derivation of a key to use for symmetric encryption more secure, and then you move on to symmetric encryption. So asymmetric algorithms, maybe a few good ones. Uh, RSA, it's old, it's classic, and it's good. Uh, People now think that 1024 or 1024-bit RSA keys are not as good. So 2048-bit keys as a default or a minimum is a pretty pretty good thing to have. The other thing is a newer one on the block is the Edward curve uh, thing. So it's the 255.19 is it's it uses elliptic curve cryptography, which is math that I don't understand and is not important. Uh, but it, use, it goes over the prime field of 255 to the 19th power. I don't know what that means either. 
but that's where the number comes from, and it's supposed to be pretty good. Yeah? Has it been around long enough for us to test it? Uh, yes. It's, it's in use for applications that generally consider that sort of, that are generally considered very security aware, like OpenSSH will let you use it as your private key, which I'll get to in a sec. So bad asymmetric algorithms, uh, DSA. DSA, and it's sort of the standard DSS and even elliptic curve DSA, all of these algorithms are sort of like, they're like the deaths of asymmetric encryption. They're just like old and not good anymore. Uh, DSA is actually particularly bad if you learn even a few bits of the key, as in like individual bits, like three bits, then you can derive the entire key from very small messages. It's like, it's not great. Attacks have been found against it. It's old, it's bad. We're not using it. What's up? Prime field of 255 to the 19th is most likely all primes from 0 to 255 to the 19th. OK. Sick. That's a huge amount of prime numbers. All right. Did everyone hear that? Does anyone do math here? Uh, <laughs> well, field need, would also need negatives. So, what, no, well, prime field is negative prime. OK, moving on from prime fields, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you can have a discussion about this afterwards, but I didn't get a math minor, and that was on purpose. Uh, so as I said before, also bad using an RSA key with less than 2048 bits. It's probably just not a good idea. It's not that hard to generate a key with more than 2048 bits, so just do it. Right. OK, the thing that's going to be really exciting about this talk, you know, for some definitions of exciting, uh, are one-way functions. Uh, <laughs> uh, one-way functions are really nifty. They destroy the original data. Uh, and what they do, so what this sort of means is they're easy, it's easy to compute the output from the input, right? So if you have the input, I like pancakes, and you run it through a one-way function, then it gives you, you know, a bunch of bytes that are basically appear random, and that's easy to compute. But then, from those bytes, it's really difficult to get back, I like pancakes. In other words, there's no decryption strategy. Like, it's just, you munge the data, and then it looks like something else, and then you're done. Like, there's nothing, you don't go backwards. Which is great, because that, for passwords, you can use that to protect confidentiality, right? If you hash a password, and you get out this string of bytes, then, you know, nobody can find out the password from that. There's no algorithm, or at least, oh, okay, they can. We'll get to that. But uh, there's no algorithm to quickly change it back like there is a decryption algorithm for a symmetric cipher. So uh, ideally, it's actually completely impossible to reverse, but uh, in reality, it's just very unfeasible for good algorithms, anyway. Uh, <laughs> And the other thing that this has to be is it has to be deterministic. Like you can't just, uh, it's not a hash algorithm if, or it's not a one-way function if you take I like pancakes and then just return actually a random string every time. Like that's not useful. <laughs> uh, it, needs to, it needs to generate the same like munged data every time so that you can use that munged data for something, right? And so from here we get cryptographically secure hash algorithms. Nick. So with the one-way functions, the idea is you authenticate, you authenticate them by putting the password, putting it into the one-way function, then if whatever comes out is what should be coming out, then you are good? Yeah. Yeah, you're getting ahead of the slides a little bit, but yeah, you got it. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious if that would be susceptible to like a known, known plain text. Uh, yes, that would be successful for a, a known plain text attack. That would be called knowing the password. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it is. Uh, more seriously, if you know part of the password, then it is susceptible to attacks depending on what hash algorithm you use, which is going to be you know, further ahead slides. So you're actually even further ahead. Uh, so just getting into crypto, cryptographically secure hash algorithms uh, that we can use as tools to build actual password storage uh, functions. We have some good ones. We have the SHA-2 algorithms. SHA is a class of algorithms, and SHA-2 is the second version of these class of algorithms, uh, which actually includes multiple discrete algorithms for different lengths of output. So like SHA-256 is you know, such and such amount of output, and SHA-512 is 
twice as much output, which makes it you know better uh, and harder to compute. So it's good. SHA-256 is pretty good, though. Like Nobody really uses SHA-12 that much. Like SHA-256 is really common. Uh, so bad algorithms, MD5. <laughs> yes, Max? I once saw MD5.js imported uh, by a website. That's interesting. Don't use that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, there are legitimate uses for MD5 besides passwords. Like, it's still decent as like a checksum. So yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> anyway, MD5 is trash. It's, uh, as far as cryptographic strength, it doesn't have any anymore. Like it's been broken. People have figured it out. You could basically do it with a bar napkin. All right. Actually, you can just put MD5 hashes into Google, and usually it will give you the answer. Unsalted MD5 <laughs> hashes, which is the last-ish oh. slide. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll get to salting also, which prevents that. Uh, so the other one is SHA-1. Like there's a SHA-2. Don't use SHA-1 anymore. It's not. Technically, there is no reliable attack on SHA-1 that will get, get you every time, but like it's getting there, it's not, it's not good anymore, just use SHA-2. Like there's a second one for a reason. Use it, it's beautiful. Don't use SHA-1. So authenticity with passwords, this is, uh, so basically verifiable identity is what authenticity is. Like you wanna know that whoever you're talking to is who you think you're talking to. So this can be server authenticity, like if you're talking to Amazon and giving them your credit card information, it is in fact actually Amazon, uh, which Christina will be talking about, and I'm gonna ignore this. I'm gonna talk about client authenticity, which uh, again, with Amazon, if Amazon wants to know it's you, passwords. Uh, that's a really big deal. But also public key crypto, which I'm gonna take an aside really quickly to talk about, because it's awesome. Uh, so with SSH, which all of you have used, I'm sure, uh, you have to type in your password every time you SSH into something, which is tedious and annoying. So they actually have, actually SSH has five different authentication schemes, but we're gonna talk about the one besides password called public key. Uh, so what you can do is, remember uh, these two algorithms, RSA and ED25519, those are the ones I said are good asymmetric algorithms, right? So you can use the SSH key gen tool to generate a private and public key uh, using each of those algorithms respectively. So the top line is generating an RSA key with 4096 bits, which is you know higher than 2048, so we're good here. And then the bottom line is just generating that other type of uh, private key. And so this is gonna put it in your SSH folder and dot SSH specifically, and you're gonna have your private key, which is gonna be an ID RSA or ID ED25519. Nathan? That's a uh, type. So oh, so key gen, type, type that, bits yeah. that, right? Is yeah, I think that's the default, but 4096 is better because the default used to be RSA 1024, and then they said that isn't good anymore, and so if you had a 1024 key, you had to regenerate them. And now, when 2048 isn't good enough, you'll already be ready. <laughs> also, 4096 is a nice number. I like 4096. <laughs> uh, so your private key will be in you know, ID RSA or ID ED blah blah blah. And your public key will be in the same file, but with .pub. And so the private key is the one you keep secret, and the public key is the one you do whatever you want with. You can you know, copy paste it to people in chat, which is something I do frequently. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's useful. If you want to get onto someone's server and they have password authentication disabled because password authentication is trash, then you paste them your public key and they add you to their authorized keys file. So authorized keys uh, is literally just a text file with a list of public keys line by line. And those are the public keys who can log into your account. And uh, if somebody has a private key and the corresponding public key is in authorized keys, they can log in without a password. It's great. Uh, you should set this up. There are a bazillion tutorials on the internet because passwords are awful. And then once you have a good way of you know, not having to enter your password, you should make your password stronger. OK, so password authentic authenticity. Words. Uh, Never encrypt passwords. We just went over that a little bit earlier. Uh, 
Encrypting passwords requires you to then decrypt the password, which is you know, the critical issue. Don't ever decrypt the password because then you know, somebody else could decrypt the password if they hack you and steal your keys. So instead, you want to use one-way functions uh, because people can't do that, right? So you can't derive the user passwords from the output. Very good. And as Nick said earlier, you don't need to. Instead of decrypting the password and comparing the two passwords, you just run the one-way function on the password and compare the two garbagey data, garbagey looking data things, and they should be the same because the one-way functions are deterministic, right? Yes, Max? Also never encrypt passwords because sometimes bad guys can read arbitrary server memory. Uh, yes. That would be another way of getting hacked. But yeah, it does, I mean, it doesn't matter because any way that you get hacked, if you're decrypting passwords, they can potentially be seen. This way, it's never your problem. Uh, so, well, actually, it can still be your problem because if uh, somebody was using, for example, the Heartbleed attack on you and they were getting access to your memory and you're hashing the passwords, then you have actually you know, the original password in your memory that you're hashing and comparing to, so it's a mess. And then you, know, you can hash passwords in JavaScript on the client side, and then you know, maybe eh, it's, it's a mess. But hopefully, you don't get hacked that badly. And most hacks aren't really a server memory dump type of hack. Like That's kind of the extreme case. <laughs> So uh, password hashing algorithms. Again, we have some good ones and we have some bad ones. The good ones are PBKDF2, Bcrypt, Scrypt, and the bad ones are anything but these. <laughs> <laughs> like really. Uh, a lot of people will implement, they'll be like, oh, password hashing is great. Let me just you know, run some SHA-2 on my passwords and throw them in the database, and we're done here. No, we're not, because another thing that Nick got to is how do people not just compare them to other known hashes? And we're going to get to that. But uh, these, these three specific functions are designed very specifically to actually be hard to break in a lot of ways. And they're sciency. And you know, a lot of intelligent people put a lot of work into these. A lot more than, ah, you know, SHA-2 sounds like a good algorithm. Let me just throw my passwords in that. So uh, yeah, we're going to talk about all three of these. And we're going to talk about the shitty end of you know not using these. So, PBKDF2, it's a general algorithm for hashing passwords. It actually can use any cryptographic hash, and it's an algorithm for uh, taking a cryptographic hash not meant for passwords and making it for passwords. Uh, so generally, it's used with SHA-256 these days. Uh, it used to be used with SHA-1, but now we are in 2015, and so don't do it. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> so the problem with this, though, is it's getting kind of old. It's, it's been around for a long time. They're, it's, it's fairly reliable, and it's basically secure-ish. But you know, there's not a lot of reason to use it, because the other algorithms are better. Uh, I mean, if it's easy, it's better to use PBKDF2 than not any of these three algorithms. And if that's your only option, it's definitely the best option. So. Next up, though, is Bcrypt. I love Bcrypt. Uh, Bcrypt is based on the Blowfish block cipher, which was invented by a very smart man in the 90s. And it's still good. Uh, so Bcrypt specifically was, huh? Bcrypt specifically was designed by the OpenBSD developers as their way of storing passwords on their operating system. And if anyone know, is familiar with OpenBSD, uh, those guys are crazy. <laughs> and they really want stuff to be secure. They have a very, very intense, intense, deep, manic love for security. Uh, to the point where they'll be like, they, they used to have Nginx in their core, which is a great web server. And then they're like, we don't like it. It's insecure. So they wrote a new one. <laughs> and it's faster than Nginx because it's OpenBSD, and they're crazy like that. So uh, they're badass. Like, I have deep appreciation for Bcrypt just because of this. And the other thing is, there are a crap load of libraries available for this. If it's a programming language, you can compute Bcrypt in it. <laughs> like, to the point of ridiculousness, like there's a great Bcrypt library for Fortran. Uh, <laughs> and Bcrypt is also memory hard. 
So this is something that I'm going to get into in a minute. But uh, unlike PBKDF2, it's hard to compute for devices that don't like accessing memory very well. Uh, so then there's Scrypt, which is not actually related to Bcrypt, despite the fact they are only one letter apart. Uh, and this is an encryption key derivation function. It was actually created for Tarsnap, a secure backup service. Uh, they take a, an encryption key that you give them, password, and they encrypt everything that you send to them with really strong encryption that is keyed by, and it's AES, symmetric encryption, right? And that the key that they use for that is derived by putting your password through Scrypt. So Scrypt is specifically a uh, key stretching algorithm, which basically means, you know, take a password, make it better for use as an encryption key, right? And so uh, it has a bunch of really sophisticated parameters. It was designed by a guy who is really all about security. Uh, Tarsnap is an incredibly good service if you want to have unreasonably paranoid encryption of your backups. You know, use Tarsnap. It's great. Uh, and Scrypt is designed to be ridiculously, ridiculously hard to compute. Uh, Bcrypt is memory hard. Scrypt is memory evil. Uh, it's actually coined the most evil algorithm by alumni Bob Somers. He has a great Ignite talk about it that explains how it works and why it's evil. Uh, you all should go to every Ignite event because they're great. Um, and uh, Bcrypt, Scrypt and Bcrypt are like kind of similar in what they're trying to accomplish with. Uh, preventing attacks. Uh, they both are salted, which I'll get into, and they both are memory hard. Uh, Scrypt is really memory hard, but also uh, that makes Scrypt sort of less good as a password storage algorithm for reasons I'll get into. So which algorithm should you use? You should use Bcrypt. Uh, Bcrypt is the best. So PBKDF2 isn't really you know, getting stronger. It's kind of old. It's just like there's not, you know, it's good, but there's Bcrypt. Uh, Scrypt wasn't designed for password storage. So when I say Bcrypt is memory hard, I mean it's four kilobytes of memory hard, and Scrypt is 16 megabytes of memory hard. <laughs> so uh, that's, it's, it's not something that's good to use for computing a bunch of logins uh, because it will, you know, use all the resources on your server. And then if you lower the difficulty of Scrypt, which you can do if you are familiar with the parameters that you can give to Scrypt and how to do that without you know, compromising your security entirely, then it becomes not that much harder to compute than Bcrypt anyway. So you know, just use Bcrypt. Uh, and what's particularly bad about Scrypt is that it has all these parameters that were designed by this guy who literally makes a secure storage service, and that is 100% of what he does for money. Uh, so he's really all down to tune these parameters, and everyone else is not. And so everyone has all these opinions about how you should run your Scrypt libraries. There aren't a lot of good ones, and a lot of the ones that exist sort of have different parameters, and they do things a little bit differently. And like nobody really agrees on what the right way to do things is, whereas Bcrypt, it's like, this is the right way to do it. You can't fuck it up. Question, Max. Yeah. <laughs> huh? I have five minutes left? Golly. OK, we can, we can hustle. The other thing is Bcrypt has been around for a long time. Uh, and even though it's been around for a really long time, it has no known vulnerabilities or weaknesses. So there's no reason not to use it. It's great. I love Bcrypt. So integrity. I sort of hinted at this a little bit for passwords. Uh, like uh, having. Having integrity in your passwords basically means, well, having integrity in your secure communications means that if somebody modifies the communication in transit, then you will know. But if somebody modifies your password in transit, then it will be wrong. So that's, it's kind of like built into the notion of passwords. And if somebody modifies the password that you have stored in the database and sets their own password, like you're just super boned. So there's, it doesn't really matter. Basically, don't get hacked and use secure transports. Christina's talk, woo. OK. Uh, so breaking passwords, man, that wasn't animated. 
So one-way functions can't be reversed. We talked about this. This is a good property. So instead, you have to try a ton of different inputs. This is known as brute forcing. And you basically take a bunch of dictionary words or any other things you think people would use as passwords, especially password and one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and you hash them according to the algorithm that the server uses. And so you just try a ton of inputs and hope you get it right, and eventually you will, especially if the password is password. And uh, a big way that people do this is they use alternative hardware that is faster at running computations. So GPUs and FPGAs and ASICs. So GPUs, everyone knows, graphics cards. Uh, they are really good at doing a ton of computations that are very similar, so you can hash a ton of passwords at once. And so even though it will individually hash like one password slower than a CPU, it will also just be hashing like thousands of them at the same time. So you know, trade-off that is very good for GPUs. Uh, FPGAs, if we have any EEs or CPEs in here, you can just be happy that you know what this means. But basically, CPEs can do cool shit that makes them compute stuff very fast, and they can uh, use this hardware uh, to get at passwords. So to defend against this, uh, we make it harder to compute password hashes. Um, so the simple way to do that is you just require more computation. That's what PBKDF does. It requires computation to uh, compute the passwords. So if somebody is trying you know, a million different passwords against a password hash, it will take you know, time as opposed to no time, right? Computation time, great. So the other thing is requiring memory usage. GPUs and, to some extent, FPGAs and ASICs are very good at computing numbers fast, but their access to memory is shitty, like really bad. Uh, a GPU has a lot less memory on it than a uh, regular computer, and all of that memory is designed in like very special pages to be loaded in like large chunks and then accessed as a big array by a bunch of processors. And uh, you know that doesn't really work for bcrypt and scrypt because they don't want it in a big chunk. They want it in you know like a sort of block-shaped thing, and then they want to access it all in like different semi-random patterns, so that the GPU can't really like it. Just it grinds to a halt. It does it really slowly. You should take uh, 419 with Dr. Lupo. And you'll learn about this, and then you'll write code that doesn't have good memory access, and it will run a bazillion times slower than it's supposed to, and you'll be upset. Nick. So I, I assume these algorithms, the algorithms for these are made public, the papers that they're publishing. Is oh, yeah, totally. So is there, couldn't you design not a GPU, but some uh, analogy of a GPU that would be specifically good at hashing, breaking these kinds of passwords, like access and memory exactly that way? So yeah, that's what an ASIC is, what Blake said. Uh, an ASIC, what does it stand for? Tell me. Uh, I don't know ASIC. I know FPGA. What about you? It's an ASIC. Application specific integrated circuit. Yeah, application specific integrated circuit. So it's basically exactly what you said. It's a circuit that is specifically designed, printed, <coughs> manufactured to do one thing. And they also have trouble accessing memory quickly uh, or having large memory banks. Like it's, you still run into all these compromises, and basically, CPUs with like large amounts of main memory are still like the best at doing this. So ASICs aren't appreciably better. Uh, which is what's great about memory hardness. Um, so the other thing you can do, and the other thing you need to do, is prevent pre-computation of hashes. So if you store in your database the MD5 hash of somebody's password, and somebody gets your database, and MD5 has been around so long, and so many people have stored MD5 hashes of passwords in databases that, as Kent mentioned, you can literally Google MD5 hashes, and if it's a common password, it will just tell you. Google will say, this is the password for this hash. It's like, man, that was easy. <laughs> like, it's, it's not great. Uh, also, MD5 is extremely cheap to compute, uh, extremely vulnerable to GPU computations. So you can literally come up with a table. They're called rainbow tables of virtually every password that someone would use, except for you know very good users, in not that much time. And then you can just look up people's hashes in your rainbow table. So the way you counter this is you add something to the password called assault. And basically what this is is you just like compute a small bit of random data and stick it on someone's password. And then 
That way, if two people have the same passwords, then they actually have different passwords because they're, the password that you're hashing is the salt plus their password. And the salt doesn't need to be secure. You store, this, you store the salt in the database right with the hashed password. And uh, then they know part of the password, but because bcrypt and scrypt and pbkdf2 are designed to prevent known plain text attacks, like Nick mentioned, it doesn't matter that they know what the salt is at all. Until someone uses power. Uh, well, then it still doesn't matter if they know what the salt is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, like you can't you can't prevent them from guessing uh, the password, but you can force them to compute the password only once they've actually retrieved the salt and the hash. Like they can't pre-compute it. And mm -hmm. yeah, and the other thing is, if like ten thousand people have the password password, you have to individually compute the hash for all ten thousand of those people. You can't just because the salts will all be different. You can't just compute one hash and be like, ah, oh, yes, all 10,000 of these hashes are the same. They must all have the same password. Max. Are there some good ways to generate salt? Randomly. Just a random number. Uh, which is done by most libraries, most bcrypt libraries. <laughs> so, salts. Wow, I just talked about this. Is this the same slide? Damn. Anyway. That's the conclusion. We're done here. Use bcrypt.